we wanted everyone to have a role in every encounter. Uh, even if your wheelman was doing most of the big action, everybody else needed to participate. Another aspect of action cinema in the modern world are vehicles. So you got airplanes, you got cars, you got motorbikes, all kinds of things that uh, don't exist in a fantasy setting. So that's something that I imagine you had to more or less work up from whole cloth to some degree in D20 system. So uh, maybe Rich, you can start. I understand you worked on the, the vehicles and chases uh, and tell us a little bit about the process of coming up with that and how you approached it. Well, you can't, I don't think you can talk about vehicle rules um, without bringing up Car Wars, right? The old uh, Steve Jackson games, Car Wars, had an infinitely unfolding road down which the the game happened, the, com the car combat game happened. And so that was, you know, certainly something that had inspired us and that was a common experience, I think. Um, and so that was really what I was, was trying to go for with, with the game. I mean, I've since then I've seen other games, I think do it more clearly, but I was really trying to go for, it doesn't really like, you don't need a map. All that really matters mm -hmm. is the relative positions of the vehicles. Are you chasing or being chased? Are you near or far? Uh, I got those gestures backwards. Those are the things that kind of matter. And then we also wanted to look at this. This was a big place where, where I felt like fun versus realism became something where we wanted to err on the side of fun. Um, an automotive crash is an incredibly traumatic event. It is absolutely traumatic for everyone who's involved, but at the same time, we didn't want like our care, our player characters to be afraid to get in a car and drive to a new location because they were afraid they might get into a car crash and then all, you know, spend the rest of the adventure in the hospital. That's kind of where sort of starting cons considerations. One of the things I think we recognize right off the bat is that like, you know, D&D uh, &D and particularly third edition is very grid oriented, right? And you got the five foot squares and whatnot, but, but, Things can't operate on that scale, right? If you have a, 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 a battle mat on your table that's 48 inches wide, a car coming by at 50 miles an hour will spend at most one round on that thing, right? So one of the first decisions, I don't remember who who posited this, right? But we moved to a different scale of 50-foot squares mm -hmm. for vehicles. Who who came up with that? Was that you, Bill? Or was that you, Rich? I don't think it was me. I know that we were talking, we were talking about what Rich said, the whole idea of relative positions. Because uh, we we had also played with that in Alternity and Star Wars. Uh, chase rules are hard. I'm not sure anyone's ever gotten them quite right. Um, but we played a long time with trying to figure out how to make that uh, uh, fun and exciting and not overly difficult to run. I seem to remember one of our Thursday nights playing Thunder Road, was yep. it? Mm -hmm. It was it was this, uh, I think it was a... Milton Bradley game. Milton Bradley game? Yeah. Where basically, you literally had those, they had two uh, two or three boards, and as you moved off one board, you took mm -hmm. the old board off, and you put right. it at the beginning again. Yep. And right. then if somebody was still on that last board, when somebody else had to move it, they got they moved gone. forward. They were gone. They're they gone. were removed from the game. Yep. So that right. was that was part of the... Uh, uh, part of the game system as well. And I think that had an influence on us. And another, well. I was going to say that we didn't, it wasn't as simple as saying that there was a linear system for just chases, because I remember using in my game, which was a post-apocalyptic game that my campaign that I ran, um, you know, it wasn't straight up Mad Max per se, but it had those moments. And, and I used the grid where we, you know, you were moving in multiple directions at that 50 foot scale a number of times. It worked, it worked pretty darn well. So, um, I'm not remembering the specifics, but but it wasn't all about that linear chase. Yeah. Right, right. I, I almost want to say that we had that scale back in Star Wars D20, but I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. It, it could be something we just picked up. You know, other games, um, I had, actually had played some science fiction games, uh, Traveler, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, when I was in college, and 
one of the things that I had in my head going into the vehicle rules was there has to be something for everybody to do. You can't just have whoever's driving the car be the only person who's rolling dice during the chase sequence. You want to give other expand the rules so that the other people in the vehicle have something to do, um, which actually wound up. And, and also decisions to make, right? It can't just be like, okay, roll the dice to see how much faster you go, right? It's got to be meaningful decisions about what you're going to do. Yeah, some of that does go back to things like Star Wars, where we 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 gave everybody a roll on a ship, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and that I mean, that was even back in the the West End version of the game. That's something we even learned from looking at certain uh, games that had come out before us. I don't want to badmouth a game, but there's one game where you you log into the the world and one player does everything, right? We didn't want that. Uh, we wanted everyone to have a role in every encounter. Uh, even if your wheelman was doing most of the big action, everybody else needed to participate. But, but you also don't want to make it too swingy, right? Like So even, yeah. if, even if everybody's just sitting in the back seat, right, you don't want that wheelman's one bad roll to now mean that everybody in the party is dead or takes, you know, the 3D well, 10 of damage or whatnot. Seen that in enough, you know, semi-modern games. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that kind of scene is one of those that's a big challenge. Another one is like uh, a hacking scene, right? Or a situation where you have the infiltration. That's another modern genre where it's, it's a little struggle sometimes to keep everybody in the scene, right? Or in the action. You know, part of that's done with some advice to the game master on how to build an encounter. And if you do have a scene where one person's got to do X, make sure there's something else going on for the others to do. They're defending them from an attack. They're uh, they're breaking into another part of the, uh, another part of the server. You know, something. Uh, and that becomes GM advice more than systemic how to build this kind of encounter. And is is advising the game master and guiding them part of the design as well in d20 monitor was that something that you you focused on oh, de definitely you know if, if we had the room there would have been more of those things like uh, charles wrote for the wealth system but we just don't have it to do it for every single rule in the game someday i might want to try to do an, an annotated rule book but that would be like eight hundred thousand pages uh <laughs> I, uh, I recently but, read through some of the GM advice in the D20 Modern rulebook. Um, reading through it now, 20 years later, it feels rushed. It feels like there's a lot of, like, this could be a whole topic, but it's one sentence in the rulebook because that was just the space that we had. Uh, and I'm criticizing myself because I think I wrote some of that. <laughs> well, well, bear in mind, whereas D&D had a player's book, a GM book. Right. And a monster mm -hmm. manual, we had one book to do it all. And some of the assumption is that you are coming from one of those other D20 games uh, where we were also, you know, there were other opportunities uh, available at this time. I had written the D&D for Dummies books, which had lots of advice in it. So we we did that a lot. So, what? You hadn't written yeah. it yet, though. That was that was another year or two down the road. Was it? Yep. Yep. That was when I, when I was over in Brand. All right. <laughs> it all blurs after 20 years yeah, it all blurs <laughs> that was a good book by the way yeah. i i really like dnd for dummies i i got it kind of on a lark and i was like oh no, this is good advice it's really solid <clears throat> talking about advice for game masters yeah i think when you're making a book that is going to be read both by players and by game masters you're kind of looking at you know five to six players and one game master right so is is that something you're thinking about when you're deciding what material to include? Oh, yeah. I mean, part of it is we write the book for both of them, and then there are certain sections that are at least specific for the player or for the GM, because the GM will read the whole book. Uh, but there are places where we'll say, players, you can, you can ignore this if you don't want to get into this level of detail. Uh, uh, but we're we're always writing to the players, right? Both the GM and the player, player character players, um, and and that's your audience is firmly in mind whenever you're writing anything. Who who are you talking to? Uh, that helps define the way you approach the the writing of the material, at least from my point of view. 
That makes sense. And like in the in the variety when you're describing vehicles and stuff, how do you decide which ones that you're going to include and which ones you're not going to include? Um, what are some of the considerations that you went through to to make those choices? Well, certainly, that's, I think that's interesting. I think that we we you want to look at like iconic vehicles, right? Like what are e- iconic vehicles that have been used in movies and TV shows? And then do you want to be specific or do you want to like genericize it? Like, do you want to put in the specific make model and year of the general Lee, or do you want to have an American muscle car? Right. Uh, but you know, the A team van at the time we were writing, I think like the getting the Humvee actually on street on American civilian streets was a thing that was just starting. But we did. We wanted to think about movies and and TV shows and try to get coverage. And so I actually think that that the content of what vehicles were available shifted quite a bit as we we all sort of contributed. What about this? What about that? Do you remember the scene from this? And one of the interesting things about a modern setting, in part because of the commercial world that we live in, compared to say a, a medieval type of setting, but in part also just because of people's awareness is that you aren't talking about, or people don't necessarily expect you to talk about generic things. They want to know about this actual Remington rifle, right? Or this actual, you know, Toyota car or whatnot. Um, so there is that question of like, when you when you put items in an equipment section, are you talking about, are you generifying it or creating types? Or are you actually going to use brand names and, and the specific things that exist in the real world? Um, but then uh, on top of what, Rich is saying and wanting to cover the basis of the icons, you also need to cover the basis of the roles. You know, a car that goes fast, a car that holds a lot of stuff, a car that's really heavily mo- uh, uh, armored or, 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 you know, powerful in that regard. Um, you know, the, the character that wants to drive a motorcycle, but do they want to drive a hog or a crotch rocket, right? You want to provide all of the options that people might, you know, be interested in and not, you know, you don't want to do 67 typical mid-sized sedans because there happen to be 67 typical mid-sized sedans on the market when only one will do that, fill that role in the game and you can do other, you know, other types and, mm-hmm. and things. And then oddly enough, this goes back and informs the weapons chapter. If you're going to put, you know, like I had to ask the question, are we going to put tanks and armor personnel carriers and helicopter gunships in the game? Because if we are, those rules need to go into the firearms section so that we actually have the stats for the weapons on those things. So, And go, going back yeah. to what Rich was saying about earlier about weapons, the firearms, it was the idea of using brands, then and you're basically in the position of judging, basically, you know, why is, is this particular right. brand better than that particular? Do we really want to say that? And so staying with a generic right. offer makes more sense as opposed to calling out particular vehicle types. Right. And Rich's method that he described, you know, where – sort of fit, what, fit, fit a bunch of archetypes of what these are, and then maybe say, here are some examples of, of vehicles that fit that archetype or, or whatnot is, is a really strong Great. design choice. Yeah, and looking at the book, to just jog my memory, we did that exact thing. We, we took a, yeah. a, a generic and then gave you a specific example from the current era. Um, so, for example, we have the stats for the Volkswagen Jetta <laughs> as your midsize uh, as your midsize wagon, right? So, uh, right. Uh, and the, I think the same is true of the firearms. We didn't compare them against each other. We took a specific at each level and used that as our as our, our spokes model, as it yeah. were. Yeah. <laughs> right. The uh, shadow chaser in the center. Base the monster hunter has on his uh, jacket a, a patch of a of a, a, a gray patch with a black dragon on it, and I actually came across we had those patches made. Yep, that was a giveaway. I still have one at somewhere. conventions, and I I came across it the other day, and I said, "Oh, now I remember what this is." So. I forgot about that. <laughs> Ooh.